Good morning. morning. It's good to see everyone here. We want to welcome each of you to our services, including those that are watching via the internet. It's good to have each one. It's a beautiful day. It's a little on the cool side. If you're like me, I thought, ah, I don't need a coat. Well, about 10 minutes outside, I was like, oh, I should have re rethought that. But it looks nice. So we're glad for the sunshine. Glad you can be here for that. I uh, want to mention a few things. Some are in the bulletin, some are not. Uh, just uh, as a way of introducing some things. One, I want to mention the website. Uh, they have a new website uh, design. I want you to take a look at that and uh, share it with others. Um, there's, I can remember a time not too long ago where you were really it if you had a website. And those are sort of, those are sort of a thing in the past in a way, uh, but they're not really. Uh, you just need to tell people about it. And, uh, and share it with others. So let me encourage you to check out the website uh, and uh, share it with other people. Some upcoming events uh, that I want to mention. Uh, they're having a crayon drive. Crayons are going to be uh, given to, it's a crayon initiative. Uh, some information in the bulletin about it. So if you have some extra crayons and you would like to uh, help Abigail's uh, AHG troop, uh, the information is there in the bulletin. Also, don't forget about Potter's Children's Home. Uh, there's some items there uh, that they are collecting that you can help um, orphans with uh, as well. Also, March 27th will be the men's breakfast, uh, so don't forget about that. Uh, as far as updates on the sick um, and other things relating to that, we want to send our sympathy uh, to Peg Bargo with the loss of Tara. Uh, the details about the services, um, I'll read them. Uh, the funeral will be March 13th at the Shorts Funeral Home in Streetsboro. The calling hours are noon to one and the memorial service starts at one o'clock. Uh, and that information is in the bulletin too. So again, we wanna extend our sympathies to Peg and the Bargo family. Uh, we know that, that must be a very difficult loss. As far as uh, some additional items, I want to remember the Tomlinsons, they're traveling. Uh, and so we want to continue to remember their, them in prayer as well. Uh, as far as the sick, uh, I'll mention a few of these. I'm not going to mention all of them in the bulletin, but some of them I want to bring to your attention. Uh, one, David X Line. As many of you remember the X Lines, they used to worship with us here. They worship at Hanoverton now. Uh, but David found out that he has cancer. And uh, the situation is very serious for him. Uh, the tests are, uh, they can have a lot of impact on his kidneys and he's been having trouble with that. Uh, so we want to remember uh, him and the family in your prayers as he's undergoing tests to see what they're able to do. And uh, also I'll mention too, Steve Higginbotham. Uh, it's Frank Higginbotham's son. Uh, he preaches at Carnes, uh, where the Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies is at, which is formerly East Tennessee School of Preaching. Uh, he has a very serious form of cancer as well. Uh, matter of fact, he's supposed to go uh, back to a cancer specialist treatment center uh, on Monday to have some extensive tests done to see uh, what the prognosis is and the treatments that they've given him. Uh, so I'm sure they would appreciate your prayers as well. Uh, coincidentally, also Annette uh, has a childhood friend. Her name's Cheryl Hurd, uh, H-U-R-D. Uh, she is. She has a very serious form of cancer as well. She's actually at the same hospital, and uh, she had some major surgery just not too long ago. And uh, appreciate you remember her in your prayers as well. Her name is Cheryl Hurd. Another one that I'll mention. Um, we want to congratulate the Birch family. Uh, Aaron Birch. Uh, many of you know Aaron and Katie Birch. Uh, they had a, a new boy, a baby boy named David Birch. I like that name. That's a good name. The, um, but he is having a little bit of difficulty uh, with some uh, things relating to, I don't know if it's just, um, jaundice or something like that. So they're watching him. Um, he is at the uh, Akron's Children's Hospital. And so the family's going through obviously a challenging time because COVID just separates the family and it's just really difficult for them. But uh, we wanna remember David Birch and of course, Aaron, Katie uh, and the family uh, and your prayers as well. Are there any other announcements or anything that I overlooked? 
Uh, speaking of overlooking, uh, don't forget uh, Francis and Joy. Uh, as uh, Joy is looking after Francis, uh, confined at home, and we want to remember him. Also, uh, Bob Peters as well, uh, and others that I'm sure they're on our hearts as well too. Make sure you get a bulletin and read through it because I didn't announce everything, but uh, certainly uh, you want to uh, remember these uh, in our prayers. If there's nothing else, we'll begin our service. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to begin this morning with 949. 949. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Hundred seven nine zero seven. Let's now go to our God in prayer. Mm 
Would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we're so very thankful, Lord, for the wonderful day you've given to us and the wonderful time you've blessed us with. We're so very thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to come here and worship you, Lord, and to give praise and honor to your name. We pray, Lord, that you be with the lesson that will be given today, Lord, and that nothing will be added to it or taken away from it, but fully given as you intended. We pray, Lord, for that our worship will be pleasing to you, Lord, and again, that we do not add to or take away, and that we give exactly as you asked. We pray, Lord, for those who could not make it at this time, for those who are ill and sick and need your comforting hand, Lord. We pray for that, and that they may be able to come to a better portion of health. We pray, Lord, that you be with those who chose not to come today, Lord, or not attune online. We pray, Lord, that, um, that we can touch their hearts in some way, and touch their lives, and help them to, to come to the next session. Again, Lord, we pray that you be with the upcoming worship, Lord, and ultimately, Lord, we pray that you forgive us of our sins as we clear our hearts and minds as we go into the rest of this morning. We're so very, very thankful, Lord, for the chance. And it's through your son's name that we pray. Amen. Number 121, 121 verses 1, 2, and 4. <clears throat> Supper, we're going to sing number 916, 916.
Again, does everyone have the communion? Okay. <clears throat> this morning, as we take opportunity, as we do each Lord's Day, to uh, remember our Savior Jesus, um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the great expression of love Christ had for us and the Father. We're all very familiar with the song, He Loved Me So. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. Why did he drink the bitter cup of sorrow, pain, and woe? Why on the cross be lifted up? Because he loved me so. Love saw man's hopeless condition. In Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 12 and verse 23, this passage tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one, and that all have sinned. 1 Peter 2, 25 tells us we were lost because we were like sheep going astray. And then Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, we read, we were dead in our sins, lost and without hope. Love was expressed. John 3, 13 through 18 tells us that God sent his only begotten son. And in John 15, 12 through 13, we can read the giving of one's life for another is the greatest expression of love. And then John 10, 11 through 18, the good shepherd, Jesus, gave his life for his sheep. Love gives us hope. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9, we were dead in our sins but God made us alive. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ. Romans 5, 5 through 11 tells us that God loved us even though we were sinners. This gives us hope through Christ and that hope will not disappoint. And then 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9, we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have a place in heaven reserved for us. Finally, the song that we also are very familiar with, He Loved Me So. 
Till Jesus comes, I'll sing his praise and then to glory go and live with him through endless days because he loved me so. And that's what we remember here today, the great love of Jesus Christ who came to this earth, suffered and died for each one of us. It's talked about in the scriptures, not because anything that he had done wrong, but because of our sin, because of what man has done. And so we remember him today and each and every Lord's Day. We come before this table, partake of this bread and of this cup to remember his broken body and his shed blood on the cross. And as we prepare to uh, partake of the bread, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come humbly bowed before you at this time. Thanking you, Lord, for this bread that represents our Savior's broken body. That body that was broken for each one of us. That body that expressed such great love for mankind. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we partake of this bread, that we might remember our Savior, remember the sacrifice that he made for us, not only today, but every day of our lives. We ask now that you bless this bread and those who partake of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give thanks for the cup. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you once again in prayer, thanking you, Lord, for this cup, this fruit of the vine. It represents our Savior's shed blood, that precious blood that was shed for us, that precious blood that washes away our sins. And we're so thankful, Heavenly Father, for that blood, and we thankful, Heavenly Father, for Christ's love and that greatest expression of love for one man to die for another. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we would always remember that great sacrifice. Remember that it was our sins that put our Savior on the cross. We pray that you bless this cup and each one who partakes of it. In Jesus' name, amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper, and at this time, take opportunity to give back to our Lord as we've prospered. We pray that each one who has taken time to reflect over this past week and how blessed we are and how much God continues to provide for us, the necessities of life, <clears throat> and even beyond that. And we pray that <clears throat> we're able to give so cheerfully as God continues to bless us and we remember those blessings each day of our lives. Again, we have the, at this time the three opportunities for you to give, and those who are here can uh, put their contributions in the back in the lock box, or you can mail um, your contributions to the church here or to the P.O. box, or you can call and make arrangements to bring that in. Uh, pray out that um, each of our members remember that this money is used to help spread God's word and to uh, keep the lights on here in the building and to um, do the things that we need to do to spread God's word throughout this world. I ask now that you go to us in, with us in prayer once again. Father in heaven, we approach your throne once again in prayer, thanking you so much, Heavenly Father, for how you provide for us. We know, Heavenly Father, that all the blessings that we have come from you. We know, Heavenly Father, that you want what's best for us in this life and that you'll provide for us those things that we need. And 
We pray, Lord, that we're good stewards of everything that you give us, both physical and spiritual. We ask that you bless each one as we give this day, and we pray that the offering will be used in a manner that's pleasing in your sight. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For those that are using songbooks, if you want to mark the invitation song, it's going to be 183, 183. And before the scripture reading lesson, we're going to sing number 250, 250. How sweet, how heavenly is the sight of rainbows that fall along. If one another's peace be light and so fulfill the word, where each can fill his brother's side and with him bear a part, when song from uh, James chapter 2, verse 1 through 13. It's James chapter 2, verse 1 through 13, or page 812 of the Pew Bibles. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place. You say to the poor man, You stand there. Or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the laws of transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. 
Mercy triumphs over judgment. Good morning. I'm very grateful that I have the opportunity to be before you this morning. I was talking to John yesterday at the food pantry, and I told him this past week I received a credit card in the mail. And it was a credit card that I had not signed up for. It had my name on it, though. And there was no explanation in the uh, stuff that came with it as to why I was receiving this credit card. So I called the number that was in the documentation, and they told me, well, this is an unemployment card. And I asked John, did you guys sign me up for that? <laughs> Are you trying to tell me something? Yes. It was fraud. Fortunately, we got it canceled. But it's amazing to me that when I called, they had I had to give them all my information to prove it was me. My birthday, the social, and they had all that somehow. So somebody had gotten a hold of my information, and I hear that we know of several others that have gone through the same thing as well. Continuing our study this week in the Epistle of James. As I was planning this lesson, I honestly thought about skipping the first six or seven verses because we looked at those verses in a previous lesson. If you remember back in chapter 1, James says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice and the, and the rich brother rejoice in his humiliation. Um, and we talked about how in Christ we are all equal and how that was that's sort of taught there in, in James chapter 1. And we looked at the first part of James chapter 2 during that lesson as well. But as I looked at this con the context here, verses 1 through 13, I didn't think that I could really leave out the first verses and keep everything in context. So we're going to look at the whole passage, which was just read for us a few moments ago, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Not going to reread everything, but uh, we are going to look at it uh, basically verse by verse. First of all, James addresses a problem here, the problem of partiality in verses 1 through 3. And the situation he sets forth here is that both a rich man and a poor man come into the assembly of the church. And the rich man is finely appareled. He's dressed in all of his riches. And it's very easy to tell by looking at this man that he is a man of wealth, a man of great means. And there also comes in a poor man who it says that he is wearing filthy clothes. Then in this hypothetical situation, the Christian shows preferential treatment to the rich man by offering him the best place to sit. The poor man is not given a seat. At the very best, he's told to sit at the footstool. We need to remember or realize that at this time, the, the, the seating arrangements when there were gatherings held significant meaning. And those who were uh, deemed more worthy got the better seats. We remember one of the parables that Jesus told in Luke 14, 7 through 11. It says, he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So you notice here from this parable, again, that the seating arrangement held significant meaning. There were seats that held higher honor uh, and uh, better regard for the ones who held those seats. And, and what we're saying here is that in this hypothetical situation in James, the Christian is showing preferential treatment, is telling the rich man, you are honored 
and he's telling the poor man, you are not. We view this rich man with more honor, with more respect than we view you. That spirit displayed in that hypothetical situation, as we talked about when we did our lesson on equality in Christ, that spirit that is displayed is anti-Christian. It's not what the Christian or how the Christian ought to behave himself. And we talked about some of these points before, but we remember, number one, that God is no respecter of persons. In Acts 10, 34 and 35, Peter says, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Now, in the context, Peter was talking about Jew and Gentile, and that God had accepted the Gentile, the Gentile as well as the Jew. But now, in our context, we can apply that to the rich and to the poor. And Peter, God would tell us, God shows no partiality. It doesn't matter if you are rich or if you are poor, earthly speaking. You have the same value in the eyes of God. And therefore, in the eyes of God's people, the rich and the poor ought to hold the same value. We need to remember that those who are worthy or deserving of honor in the kingdom of Christ are not necessarily the same group of people that are worthy of honor and respect out in the world. In verses uh, 5 through 7, James says, and this was read, but we're going to look at it again. Listen, my beloved brethren, God has not chosen, the, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the churches? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? So this must have been more than just a hypothetical situation. There must have been instances where this occurred, and I'm sure throughout the history of the church there are instances where this occurred. But James is pointing out, and again, if anything, it's more likely that the poor man should have received the better, the better seat because he says in general, now he's speaking generally here, it's the rich who uh, oppose you, who oppose Christianity, who dishonor that noble name by which you are called, that noble name being Christianity. And so those whom the world would look at as deserving of honor are not necessarily the same as in the kingdom of Christ who is deserving of honor. Remember the words of Jesus when he's responding to the mother of James and John. In Matthew chapter 20, we're going to start at verse 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down, and asked something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand, the other on the left, in your kingdom. There's that sitting on his right hand and left hand, the two places of highest honor. That's what she wanted for her sons, James and John. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am about to be I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed, indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And so Jesus here points out that greatness in the world and greatness in the kingdom are opposite. Those in the world who are great, who are deemed worthy of honor and respect and obedience are the rich and the powerful. And he says, though, in the kingdom, those who would be great in the kingdom are those who serve others, those who are willing to indebt themselves to God and serve and, and work for the betterment, for the profit of others. 
But in this situation now that, that James is dealing with, in treating the poor differently than the rich, James says you've become a judge, an unjust judge with evil thoughts. James 2 and verse 4. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? We know that as Christians, we're not to judge according to appearance, but that's exactly the situation that James describes when the rich and the poor come in. They know nothing about these men other than what they see with their eyes. And they have judged according to that. Jesus told us in John 20, uh, 7, 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The truth is that we really, we ought not to show partiality to either the rich or the poor. We shouldn't judge them based on that one way or the other. Back in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 15, it says, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. So very clear there, don't show partiality to the rich, but also don't show partiality to the poor either. You judge them based upon their actions, based upon who they are and how they behave themselves. So to show partiality in the way that James is describing there, it's a violation of what he describes in verse 8 as that royal law. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, what is that royal law, James? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. Why does he call this law the royal law? Why is that the case? That's, that's an unusual uh, adjective to describe the law of Christ. The word for royal there, the Greek word means regal or kingly, or preeminent. So the command to love your neighbor is a regal command. It is a kingly demand. It is a preeminent command of our Lord. We remember, of course, that when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment in the law? You remember what he said in Matthew chapter 22. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your uh, mind. This is the first and great commandment, but remember the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. So fulfill the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. It's one of the two greatest laws of that law of Moses. And Jesus says on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. So the problem of partiality, it's very real. We need to understand that I, I've never witnessed anything like that in this congregation, but we need to realize that partiality of any sort is wrong. Uh, showing preferential treatment to someone because of race is wrong. Because of wealth is wrong. Because of uh, social standing, whatever it might be, because of uh, gender is wrong. Uh, we should not be partial in any way. It is a violation of loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, James moves on, and he begins to talk about if you've broken part of the law, you've become transgressors of all of the law. So those who demonstrate partiality, really based on any reason, have sinned and are found to be transgressors of the law. Verse 9, if you show partiality, you commit sin. He doesn't beat around the bush. He, he comes out very plainly and states, if you show partiality, you're committing sin and you are convicted by the law as transgressors. We are not at liberty as Christians to pick and choose which laws of God's that we are going to obey. When we disobey one of God's laws, we have become transgressors of the law. James 2 and verse 10, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Some say, well, that's very harsh. Before we think that, though, stop and realize that we accept that in our everyday lives in regard to the laws of man. If somebody commits a murder, what are they? They are a criminal. They are a transgressor of the law. It doesn't matter that they didn't steal. They're, they're a lawbreaker because they have taken a life. And, and it's the same way in God's law. 
He gives us his law, and when we break it, we are lawbreakers. Now, thanks be to God, we're going to talk a little bit about mercy here in a few, a few moments, because if it weren't for mercy, then all of us are lost and have no hope whatsoever. So thank God for mercy, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But this idea that we can't pick and choose the laws that we're going to obey, it's very important for us to grasp that fact. Why? Because there are people out there who call themselves Christians who will tell you that some of the teachings of the Scripture are more important than others. For example, they may argue that acknowledging the Lordship and the deity of Christ is definitely a requirement for salvation, but that respecting Jesus' teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, for example, that's of secondary importance. That's just one example. But that's the type of mentality that many have. It's presumption of the highest degree to presume to rank God's laws in terms of importance as we see them. It's just wrong. And that's what James is really getting at in verse 11 of, of James 2. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. In other words, the same God who says you have to believe in Jesus is the same God who through Jesus gave us the teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. So how can we argue that one is more important than the other when both came from God? And they weren't termed or worded as suggestions or optional or anything like that. They are stated as commands that we must obey. The commands of Jesus, yes, they're important and they must be obeyed. But we need to understand as well that the commands of the apostles are also important and must be obeyed. We remember, of course, when Peter gave his confession to the Lord in Matthew chapter 16, and he tells the Lord, Jesus asked them, who, who, do, who do you say that I am? And Peter's response was, you are the, the Christ, the son of the living God. Remember what Jesus says to them. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I say unto you that you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's so much we can talk about in this passage. Uh, I hate not talking about some of it because I, it can be confusing, but, but keep this in mind. Now, Jesus talking to Peter, and I would suggest to you that this, though, doesn't only apply to Peter, but to all the apostles. He says, whatever you bind on earth, literally, will have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. What's he saying? He's saying there, you're going to have authority. Therefore, to obey the commands of Jesus... I must also obey the teachings, the commands of the apostles as well. You remember what uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. We are, he's talking about apostles, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He describes the apostles as ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is one who speaks with the authority of the nation or the people whom they are representing. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, Paul said, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. So then who are we as human beings, uninspired, miraculously human beings, to say this law is more important than that law? You must keep this law, but that law is not important. James says, the same God who gave you that law gave you that law as well. And if you break that law, you are a transgressor just as much as if you broke that law. That's what we're being taught here by James. So transgressors of the law. Why is this stated in this context? Why is it mentioned here? Well, by showing partiality, Christians were violating that one, love your neighbor as yourself, so they then have become transgressors of the law. So now James moves on to talking about judgment and mercy. So in verse 12, James says, So speak and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Speak and do 
as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. We understand that we're all going to be judged. Knowing that one day we're going to be judged, behave yourself with that in mind. Speaking and doing, that encompasses the majority of human activity. Speak what you speak and what you do. The only other thing I can really think of is what you think. But what you, what you think leads really to what you speak and what you do, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But in all that we do, we must remember that we're going to be judged one day. Hebrews 4 and verse 13 says that we're going to give an account. There is no creature hidden from his sight, God's sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Remember, of course, when we're children and our parents uh, are trying to find out if we've broken a rule or done something that we shouldn't have done, and maybe as a child you would not tell the truth and try to get away with it. But, you know, sometimes when your parents ask you, they already know whether you're guilty or not. They want, they want to know if you're going to be honest about it. But realize, though, that when we go to God for judgment, he already knows if we're guilty or if we're innocent. And I can tell you right now, all of us are guilty of sin. All of us are guilty of sin. We're going to be judged, James says, by the law of liberty. Another interesting designation, he used that that phrase as well in chapter 1. I, I didn't really comment on it too much. We're going to be judged by the law of liberty. The law of Christ is a law that gives freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from commands? There, you know, there are people who say we don't live under law, so there's no rules that we really have to obey. That's ridiculous. We live under the law of Christ, and that law gives us freedom from sin, not freedom from law. Freedom from sin. Remember what Jesus said in John 8, 32 to 34. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, they, Jews didn't like that. They said, we are Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And we've all committed sin, right? So we, we're slaves of sin, but the law of liberty will give us freedom from that. All, one day, all of us are going to be judged by that law of liberty, John 12, 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So, to break one part of the law means you're a lawbreaker, you're a criminal. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Are we all lost? Do we all have no hope? Well, James in verse 13 mentions mercy. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. The word mercy means pity on someone or something that is in distress. In this statement here, judgment is without mercy on the one who has shown no mercy, fits into this context because... The Christians in this situation are not showing any mercy or pity on the poor man. They're not treating the poor man with the respect that they should be treating the poor man. So they're not showing any mercy. And James is saying, if you don't show mercy in this life, don't expect mercy at the judgment. All of us need the mercy of God. I hope we understand that. We all need that mercy. We need that pity. Why? Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and verse 23. Therefore I am a lawbreaker, and I need God's mercy. Now the mercy of God is available to you and me because Jesus came to this earth and died as a sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And God's mercy is available to you and me in the fact that as, as we obey the gospel and then continue to strive to live according to the teachings of Christ, that blood of Jesus will continue to wash away my sins and remove the guilt of those sins from me. 1 John 1 in verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We've looked at this verse, it seems like several times recently, but it applies. So James makes the statement, mercy triumphs over judgment. 
What does he mean by that? I want to, I want to, this, this one is in your outline. If you're filling out an outline, I want to look at a passage in Matthew 18, verses 23 to 35. Uh, this is a parable that Jesus gave that I think demonstrates what James is talking about here uh, when he says uh, mercy um, triumphs over judgment. So, Matthew 18, 23 to 35. Jesus says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Applying this parable, we're the 10,000 talent man. Okay. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. What's he asking for there? He's asking for mercy. He's asking for compassion and pity from his master. Verse 27, And the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out, found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he had laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Put, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. He would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So, this is Jesus' conclusion, so my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. I think that's parallel to what James says here in chapter 2, that mercy triumphs over judgment. In this parable that Jesus gives, this servant owes him a vast amount and cannot pay. There's no way in the world this man could repay that amount. And he begs for mercy, and the master gives it. Pity on those who are in distress. That's a demonstration of mercy. Now, judgment would say, no, this man owes. He can't pay. He's going to prison. Mercy says, I'll forgive you of that. And then, of course, the rest of the story emphasizes what James says, in that the servant who was forgiven in turn would not forgive a debt that another owed. And so when the master finds out, he condemns him. And James tells us that if we show no mercy, then no mercy will be shown to us. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We could reword that mercy triumphs over condemnation. All of us have broken God's law. We read that, Romans 3.23. We're worthy of death. The mercy of God triumphs over that, though, and he makes our salvation possible so that the Apostle Paul could say in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So mercy can triumph over judgment. Now, in saying that, we are not suggesting that we don't need to obey that we don't need to do the will of God. But as we noticed, God's mercy is manifest to us in that as we strive to walk in the light, the blood of Jesus will continually cleanse us when we fail, when we don't walk in the light. Mercy and judgment. I don't know about you. I, I know I'm going to be judged, but I need and you need the mercy of God, and I am grateful for it that he sent Jesus to pay the price for my sins so that I have the opportunity to be forgiven and have no condemnation in Christ. 
As we conclude the lesson today, if there are any here who have yet to obey the gospel of Christ, we offer you an opportunity now to do that. You certainly can make this decision at any time, but at this time we offer you an opportunity where if you want to have your sins forgiven, you realize you're, you've broken God's law. There is sin in your life and you're lost. You can have those sins washed away by the blood of Jesus by obeying him. If you believe that he's the son of God, are willing to confess your faith and repent of your sins and submit to be baptized, your sins will be washed away. If you're already a Christian who's not continued to walk in the light, understand also that the mercy of God is still available to you. Repent of the sin in your life. Confess your sin to God and, and he will forgive you as you repent of it. As we conclude the lesson, if there are any here who need to respond, certainly we, we invite you to come forward as we sing. Those online who are watching, we invite you to get into contact with me or one of the elders after services if you would like to study the Bible, you would like to obey the gospel, or you need the prayers of the church, and we'll, we'll help you in whatever way we can. We encourage you to come as we stand and as we sing. God in his mercy and his love takes away every sin. Through the shed blood of Christ above, making me whole again. He is my God, my help, my strength. Throughout the for the excellent lesson. I want to thank each of you for being here, those of you who are here physically present in the building. It's an encouragement to me and to each one to be able to fellowship together as we worship uh, God. For those of you who are joining online through the streaming, we're thankful that you have joined us this morning. We want everyone to know that our Wednesday night Bible study has returned to its normal uh, normalcy, <laughs> whatever. Uh, so we have classes for all ages. Um, and then uh, after 40 minutes of class, we reassemble in the uh, auditorium all together and have a devotion together devotional so uh, we invite you back Wednesday evening for our midweek Bible study and uh, again next Sunday morning for our worship service for our closing song today to go along with the lesson um, 679 679 Would you bow with me, please?
Our most gracious and loving Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day that we have had, that we can come together with our brothers and sisters and worship you. Father, we're thankful for the men and women of our armed forces that protect us freedom, that we can assemble without fear, without persecution. Father, we just ask that you bless them wherever they may be in this world, protecting that freedom, that when their time is done, that they'll be able to return home safely to their families once again. Father, we're very thankful for all the physical blessings of this life that we enjoy each and every day, but Father, especially the spiritual blessings that we enjoy, that knowing that we can have that home with you in heaven someday. Father, we ask that you please be with those of our number who are away from us this morning due to illness. There are many on our prayer list, Father, that are dealing with the loss of loved ones, those that are battling cancer. We just ask your blessings upon them, that you help them with the need that they have, that they may soon be able to be back with us once again. Father, we ask that you please be with us as we depart here today and we go our separate ways. We ask that you watch over us as we go through this week. Help us to overcome the stumbling blocks that appear in our path. We just ask that you help us to look to you for strength as we go through this week. Father, we ask that you please forgive us of those things that you see wrong in us, Father, and help us to overcome them in the future. All these favors and blessings we ask in Jesus' dear name. Amen. <clears throat>